open vent Bristol. Are you ready, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here. I can, I can share my screen. Okay, great. Why don't you do that? And let me just say that I, I love open vent Bristol um, for two reasons. One, um, Darren was one of the first to make a, a, an open system. He made a video of a very early prototype, which was very helpful. That, I think that was back in March. And secondly, um, they have been open uh, not only at the overall level, but at the component level, including producing an open um, uh, flow sensor, which, as you may know, many of there's a great uh, supply crunch on flow sensors worldwide. Um, a number of teams, including Respire Works, have uh, made their own. Uh, but that's an example of where we as a community can reuse things. So go ahead, please. Great. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, so this is this is Open Vent Bristol, uh, and we started off our project in in Bristol, as you may expect. But it's the team has come a long way since then. Um, so we've got we've got sort of areas such as uh, mechanical, electronics, software, and software and electronic verification in our in our in our sort of grasp now. Um, our our design our ventilator is based on AmbiBag for um, for various reasons, but mainly that they're Already, already medical devices, albeit for a slightly different application of manual ventilation. Um, they're quite readily available in most countries' healthcare systems and they're super low cost, so they're, they're very available. Um, the, the big theme with our project overall has been simplicity to, um, to try and um, make the design sort of as simple as possible using readily available parts and manufacturing processes to mean that we can manufacture this rapidly. So the, the photograph you see in the top right, that contains all the parts needed to build one of our ventilators. It's not, not super complex um, and, and that's definitely intentional. Um, we've left the top window of the ventilator uh, transparent um, so that you can intuitively see the bag being squeezed, but it still needs to have an enclosure to it um, to pass various regulations, but it's, uh, but I think it's, it's interesting that we, that we kind of chose to still keep it open like that. Um, our original design and most of the decisions that we've made so far has been based on the MHRA requirements document, which Pierre flashed on the screen earlier. Um, and a lot of the design choices you'll see are based on that, but we're aiming towards uh, an EUA uh, through the FDA um, and trying to sort of keep our, our sites focused on longer term FDA goals as well. Um, this is this is what our device looks like. This is this is pretty much exactly how the real thing looks and how it will look, apart from a couple of changes because uh, we're still we're still designing it. It's not complete yet, such as the uh, the peep valve position is is going to change, but mostly it, it's going to look pretty much like it does there with with the two display screens on the on the front, one for um, one for set parameters, one for measure parameters, and a and quite a basic UI and description of alarm states, various labels that are all part of the, uh, the regulations. Um, one, one thing, and in fact, the only thing that we've created, which isn't an off the shelf part, is the flow sensor unit, as, as Robert mentioned. Um, and for, for similar mentions, similar, similar reasons that uh, Respira Works mentioned, these flow sensor units are quite scarce at the moment because they're only um, they're only really available to those existing manufacturers of ventilators, so the, so the, uh, the availability is quite unpredictable. Um, so the reason we've made our own is to control our supply chain. Uh, and what we've done is we, we've, we've, designed, um, we've designed a flow sensor in the simplest way that we could uh, with just a few number of parts and using a, a simple washer to create a pressure drop and measuring that. Um, and the graph at the bottom of the screen shows um, shows our, our sensor readings in comparison to an existing off-the-shelf ventilator sensor and, and the results look pretty good. Um, it can be designed and made either using 3D printing, CNC machining or injection molding if you can afford the mold. Um, this is the, the graph on, on the right is it was measured by a test lung at the Naz National Physical Laboratory in London. Um, using using our uh, using our ventilator uh, in pressure controlled ventilation mode, um, and the the kind of shape and the graph and the way that the way that it behaves and responds is is quite uh, quite sort of similar to what you'd expect from from existing ventilator systems, um, which is which is good. 
we're currently in development of the of the spontaneous mode. I'm still not quite sure the the right the right word to use to describe this, but um, this is the mode where it senses that, that the person wants to take a breath and then responds to them because this mode is um, increasingly becoming more important and more uh, applicable to more people around um, who are being treated for for this. More uh, like it sort of applies to more people than for mandatory ventilation, from, from what I've heard. And is also pretty crucial in weaning people away from ventilation. Um, so the graph at the bottom of the screen just it just shows while our ventilator's off that, that we can sense when when somebody's making a breath in. Um, where where we're at, at the moment is we're we're currently in some conversations with manufacturers uh, trying to build those links, but we're we're still in need of um, uh, sort of ga gathering more contacts in that uh, on that front. The same goes with users and. Uh, and also trying to gather some more funding to help us to to continue um, and and that's it from me thanks thanks very much and if there's any time then I'm happy to take a few questions so, thank you very much Darren I'll, I'm gonna start with, with the same question you know what how advanced are you into planning your testing to the safety standards, the biocompatibility, the electrical safety? Um, biocompatibility, we, we have a materials engineer who's been advising us on, on that. Um, so we're, we're sort of aware of what the, what the standards want, um, mainly based on MHRA, but trying to focus in on the ones that are quoted by FDA as well. Uh, we haven't done any uh, testing apart from that, but we're just trying to use materials which are already proven to be safe to be used in the airway and so forth. Um, for the electrical safety, we haven't we haven't been able to test the machine to that yet because we haven't sort of we're not we're not finished designing the machine yet uh, and designing the electronics. Um, uh, there may be possibilities for the test house they use in London to give us initial steers on that, um, but, I, but I would assume sort of later on it, it falls down to the responsibility of the manufacturer but what we can do is as much as we can um, to understand those standards um, and uh, and sort of sort of work work as best as we can using a risk-based approach to kind of design it using using the right tools um, and we then there might be some possibility for some third party testing at an early stage with with the test house in London as, as I mentioned that's that's sort of where we're at at the moment yeah I just wanted to say that I really um, appreciated the uh, novel design for the flow sensor. I thought that was um, really great to see a, um, a clever solution like that. Um, do you guys have sort of a tentative timeline for moving forward or not necessarily? Um, roughly, it's always, it's always hard to predict. Things always happen that you don't expect, but um, we're hoping to, what would I say roughly, maybe in around four to six weeks, we'd expect to have our, our design to a stage where we're happy with it to do some more testing with the test lung, so something in that order of weeks. Uh, if we're mm -hmm. lucky, it might be sooner. If things pop up, it might be a bit later. Something like that. Um. I see two questions in the Q&A about the bags tearing. So I'll let Darren answer this question. Have you considered this thing? And I also post an answer because this has been discussed into Helpful Engineering Slack. But Darren, I'll let you answer live as well. Uh, if the bag tears, what is the... Oh, it's just disappeared. Um, so, so... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's the impact on the patient in the, if the back tears? And I would say also, what have you built into your design to mitigate this risk? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So if, if the bag tears, then um, we should be able to sense that um, in probably a number of different ways. I, I guess one is that the motor would, would kind of go further than we expect, and we can, we can sense that. Um, we should also sense um, pressure drops in the tubing, um, so there, there should be there should be more than one way of of sensing that. I I, I would think, um, yeah. So I, I think that's definitely something we're factoring in, and that's 
I think that I think that features in our hazard analysis. Although I need to I need to kind of revisit that. Again. But um, there should definitely be ways of sensing that, um, either either through the motor current or by by sensing sort of the pressure in the in the airway tubing. Um, but yeah, we're, we're continuing to sort of life test the system to, to understand that. There was an early life test done by, um, by the team that we joined forces with where they, they tested to 600,000 cycles using one of the Ambu bags. Um, and, and there was no sort of noticeable damage to it. I guess it depends a lot on what the shape is that's pressing against it and how, how sharp or, or not sharp that is. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to do do some more testing to make sure that we uh, we don't let the bag tear. Thank you. Yes, I, I will just comment on this response briefly because that's a great example of the rationale you are supposed to have during your risk management process. So to identify a hazard and then you really try to work on the whole chain of events of things that are happening because there's a reason for this to happen and then you have the consequences of these things. So wherever you start in the process, you always need to move in both directions. You need to identify a bit more about the root cause and then to identify the consequences and to develop that. And then you have to work on design solutions to make sure it doesn't happen. And you can work also on um, con controls that uh, measure that and detect that, which are a less preferred solution, but still an applicable solution as well. And then you have also the warning and information to user and I would say that in your case, the clear panel on top is part of that. It's providing the user with the visual information that he can check the condition of the bag for himself. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we've got a bit of a rule where if we can't answer the question, if, if there's no obvious answer to a question, then we put it through the hazard analysis and that probably helps us to work out, hey, there's a few options we've got, which one is, is kind of the least risky. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, are we 